Hello. Welcome to day two of the UK Creative Festival. Um, I want to say a quick thank you to our sponsors, uh, Densu Creative and Soho Friends. And I'm sure I should be mentioning uh, Odelay Films as well for all of the delicate heads in the house today. Um, this talk is uh, on the theme of Mavericks of Leadership and why representation matters in creative leadership. It's hosted by Ete Davis of Dentsu Creative with Jerry Dakin, Chris Kenner, and Chanda Panya. So please welcome them to the stage. Thank you. Thanks, Ete. Thank you. Oh. Oops. He's on stage. Find some space. Um, it's not hosted by Ete, it's hosted by me, Chris. So. <laughs> but, um, and we've, you can see as well, we've got an extra panelist. Um, do you want to introduce your daughter? Is this working? Yeah. yeah. So uh, this is my daughter, Marnie, and I pulled her out of school today because I thought this is far more relevant and important than a day of doing dance, drama, swimming. Maths and English obviously are important, but uh, I thought she'd learn a lot more from this than uh, a day at school. <laughs> cool. All right. So I think first, just I feel like I'm shouting. Um, Shall we just go along and introduce ourselves? I'll start. Um, I'm Chris Kenner. I'm the chairman of Brand Advance Group, and I'm the CEO of North America, which means I've jumped from Manchester to New York, and I'm living in New York now and heading up our office there. And Brand Advance Group is a group of 11 companies. There's a creative agency, a media agency. We own a load of magazines that speak to black people and LGBT and disability. Um, but all with one focus, helping brands to reach minority group. Well, they're not really minority because there's more people that look like me on earth than white people, I'm sorry to say. But, um, but yeah, making sure that everyone is seen, heard, and their media is spent in. Go on, Jerry. Awesome, and I work um, at a brand, a client, um, helping them spend their media and their advertising. Uh, it's a company called Beam Suntory, which you may never have heard of, but it's an alcohol company. We make like Sipsmith Gin and Maker's Mark, and in the UK, we also make Ribena and Lucas Aid. Good choices. Um, and I'm also uh, a WFA, World Federation of Advertisers, Global Diversity Ambassador, um, trying to bring people together from global marketing industry to think how do we improve the diversity of our industry and also kind of what we put out there I've even just written a book that comes out next month on the bit about what you put out there and how we do more inclusive marketing. Yeah, thanks. Um, I'm Ete Davies, uh, Chief Operating Officer for Dentu Creative, um, which is the creative network for uh, the Dentu um, Advertising and Marketing Network. Hi, I'm Chanda Pandya, and I um, well, spent most of my life in fashion buying, and I was a buying director for um, Arcadia Group when it existed, um, and other high street retailers. Um, and now I have decided to give back, and I've, um, I'm a lecturer at uh, the Fashion Retail Academy in London South Bank University, and I lecture on fashion buying, merchandising, business, marketing, and promotion. I've got nothing to say. <laughs> <laughs> My name's Marnie. Yay! <laughs> cool. So today we're going to talk a bit about leadership and diversity in leadership and diversity within the industry. Um, and where we think we are now and where we need to be so that some of the people, because I see there's a lot of young people in the audience, how you can come and take our jobs off us and do it better. Because I'm pretty sure you will. So, I'm going to start with you, Etty, just because you've had some, some big jobs, you know, like MD at Analog, CEO at um, Engine, was it? Yeah. Uh, and now at Dentsu. So tell us where you think the industry is, you know, with having people that look like us at the, <laughs> in leadership. You're going straight in with the big questions there. Yeah. Um, I mean, the truth and the honest answer is, um, not anywhere where we need to be. Um, you know, you and I know each other for a, a, a while, and we've been in this representation or driving representation within the industry for you know the better part of a, a decade. So there's been a lot of progress in yeah. terms of the conversation and sort of awareness and it being on the agenda compared to you know 10 years ago when it it wasn't. So that's some progress. But in terms of the actual representation, and I think sort of 
tangible roles that are equitable across the leadership team that really drive uh, value and, and influence. Um, we're, we're, not, we're not there really yet at all. If you look at some of the stats from you know, the IPA studies or the advertising uh, industry uh, association studies, we've actually had a bit of a backwards trend in terms of representation in, 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 se in senior leadership when you're looking at the C-suite, MD level, C-suite plus. Um, you know, there was a, a bit of a spike sort of four years ago and, and now it's starting to you know, kind of go backwards. Number of reasons for that, I think. I think the, the, the critical one is the pipeline. There's so much um, churn, I guess, at that sort of preeminent level before you get to you know, a, a leadership role, which I'm sure we'll sort of talk about the reasons for that yeah. shortly. And so without that, that pipeline, and without the real focus, I think, critically on retention and progression of underrepresented groups, I don't see how we stop the current backwards slide that the data is showing us anyway. Yeah. Um, but yeah. Jerry, I'm going to come to you because I think br brands and therefore our clients have, you know, a major role to play in telling us as agencies what you want working on your work, you know, what, uh, so that the output reflects the consumers that you're trying to get. You've had some big jobs, Diageo, GSK, now Halion, and now back to alcohol again. Um, <laughs> so, uh, you know, allyship and clients, what do you think both can do to help with? Yeah, I think, I mean, like, when our clients ultimately, like, sit at the top of the advertising tree, don't they, in terms of, like, the money and, and, what, and what they do. I mean, clients are, are far from perfect. I think, if anything, we are behind a lot of our agencies, a lot of our partners, um, and we have a lot more to do around all sorts of aspects of diversity, especially, like, class and race and gender and, you know, <laughs> everything. Um, but, yeah, there is a, there is, it is good that more clients are waking up and realizing that, you know, we don't have it in our teams. We don't, we don't, we're not where we need to be in terms of having those different voices around the table. And it's, I mean, advertising, every industry should be, you know, diverse, inclusive, and representative, of course. But advertising feels like the industry that just fundamentally has to be, because it's literally our job to understand people who are different to us. It's your, it's your job if you work in advertising. You're never making an advert for yourself. You know? You're never making an advert for people who are just like you. So it's our job as advertisers to look outside that. And I think it, it is positive that more clients are starting to wake up to this. You're starting to see like pitches and RFPs in which we're at least asking the question. Um, because you know, as soon as a client starts asking a question, that, you know, that trickles down. Agencies invest in it. They put resources in it. They make sure it happens. It's not easy. It's not an easy fix. And I can. I think one of the things that I think is challenging at the moment is we, we're pushing a lot on kind of like diversity and like numbers of people who are in getting people into the industry, but we have a lot of work to do on inclusion and whether those people like truly feel a part of the industry, truly feel welcome. Like the, the stats from some of that research shows that like people from minority groups are much more likely to be thinking about leaving the industry. Though we did say we were going to, because you know, a lot of you young thinking about joining our industry, we're going to be, we're going to be, we're not going to um, cover up the truth, but we're, you know, we're going to try and paint a more positive picture because things are changing and there is really good momentum. And I think a lot of like, maybe for years, some senior leaders across all parts of our industry were like nodding to DNI, but it does feel like it's really being embedded into what people are doing now. So it, change is starting to come, but long way to go. Yep, and could come a bit faster to be honest. Like. I think that just to add to that, I think the biggest issue is that, um, and the Business of Fashion did a piece on this, that actually they are hired because it's tokenism or a tick box exercise, hired but not heard. And that is the problem. They are hiring diversity officers, diversity managers, inclusion people, but actually they're not giving them the resource and they're not putting the infrastructure in to allow them to actually do what needs to be done and change the narrative. So actually just having somebody in that title. And the biggest problem is that the people often they are putting in those roles, middle class white men or women, you have to be, understand it from a grassroots level. You have to understand the challenges. You have to live the challenges and be able to therefore take action and, and comprehend why there is an issue. And it starts with actually changing it from a young age, changing it from education, changing it from what we teach, how we talk about it, and therefore the future leaders, it becomes, it, there is no need for diversity inclusion because it is just, you take people on merit. 
not on because I have to. Like the F, uh, FCA recently um, said that they have to now. It has it's a requirement not a regulation yet, but a requirement that 40% of their leadership workforce should be female. And out of that, one person should be from an ethnic minority. minority. One. 40% female, but one ethnic minority. That screams a problem to me. We're so the, the leaders are actually creating the issues and in, in the wrong way, they're not dealing with it in the right way. Setting the bar quite low there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah exactly. Yeah. But we're going to make it positive in that actually change is happening. It is unfortunate that it took something like the killing of George Floyd, a Black Lives Matter movement, for it to come so high up on the agenda. But every business, every company is now worried about their ESG and their CSR. ESG is... Um, uh, economic social governance and their CSR, the corporate social responsibility. So what you see the companies doing. So now they're sort of peddling and thinking, right, we have to tackle this issue. We have to do something about it. And some genuinely are. Smaller businesses, in fact, can react easily. But when you've got a lot of red tape and bureaucracy, that's when it becomes difficult. And do you think as well there's a shift, and this is to all of you, do you think there's a shift as well because of consumers? So, you know, look at top man, top shop, you know, they stuck. Kate Moss, and yeah, she's beautiful, but they stuck Kate Moss in the window for the last 10 years, and everyone sort of went, that ain't me, you know, I don't identify. But then you had Boohoo, which is down on my end of the country, sticking plus-side models, you know, black, brown, Muslim models in adverts, and they boomed when, well, where is Topshop now? So do you think sort of the consumer is going to make all of us ensure that there are people from each community so that we represent their brand. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree with that. I mean, we're sort of in, I guess you could describe the age of activism, right? You've got brand activism, organizational one. Yeah. The most powerful one over the last sort of two and a half years, going back to you know, the point around the murder of George Floyd, was consumer activism and sort of you know, people actively choosing um, how they support brands, but also like sabotaging you know, the sort of the progress and the effects of brands, whether it's through, you know, sort of TikTok storms or you know, various other things. So, you know, people understand and you know, consumers understand the power they have to influence the organizations that actually play quite an integral role uh, in, in their lives. Yeah. And they are you know, demanding to a certain extent that better representation, not just more people that look like them, but people that look like their social circle and businesses that reflect their values and the world that they want to see, whether mm. it's regards to ESG, whether it's regards to, you know, sort of CSR. It's more than even just, I want to see somebody that looks like me in an advert. I want to see a brand that's also enabling people that I support and that I'm an ally to and, you know, the causes that I, I also believe in. So that, that drive is, is, is definitely happening. It's, you know, going back to Jerry's point, it is like bonkers that we work in the communications industry that is all about reaching consumers and audiences and every brand talks about how do we grow, how do we reach, you know, the sort of kind of untapped areas. Um, and that only happens when you have people from those communities that you're trying to build engagement with, that you're trying to grow inside the conversation, you know, inside the work. Um, so, you know, the fact that we're even talking about that being the lever to doing our jobs more effectively still baffles me, but, you know, it's, it's sort of front and center now. I think there's quite a bit of research out as well. There's a piece of research that we did where um, we took 1,000 people. Uh, it was a partnership with ITV, System One, and then the consultancy part of Brand Advance. And um, we took 1,000 people, 100 from each community that we could get across the UK. So 100 Indian, Pakistani, LGBTQ+, different abilities, religion. Um, and using facial recognition technology, we made them watch, each of them watched 100 TV adverts. And the facial recognition followed their emotional journey throughout the adverts. Because we wanted to see what people thought about different representation in adverts. But actually, a piece of, um, a, a, a sort of, a result came out that we weren't expecting, which was, if the ad showed some depiction of diversity, a minority group, or, you know, just wasn't just the same as we've seen for many years of the same sort of uh, middle class white family. If it had some kind of diversity, there was an emotional journey by all 1,000 people that Amazing. watched it. If it didn't, there would be a drop off of between 20 and 60 percent where people didn't actually watch it to the end because they just went, well, this isn't even about me or about you didn't actually need to be from that community 
to have affinity to an ad that was depicting a minority group because you sort of went, okay, I'm not black, but if they see black and I'm gay, then um, they, mu they must see me as well, you know? Because uh, uh, that was the sort of uh, a... I think it's often just a sign of like more considered and more thought through work. Like, I mean, yeah. I'm, a, I'm a gay man. I don't expect like every advert on TV to show gay people. It would be really, really weird, I won't swear, if it did. <laughs> um, but obviously I, I do notice when they do and like I like it and it makes brands stand out for me. But I also think that like when, you know, in their LGBT lived experience, there's loads of like really interesting like lives and nuances and stories and things to tell. The same, you know, with different cultures, with different ages, with different classes, with different backgrounds. And so like, you know, inclusive representative advertising isn't just like, let's take my script um, for my middle class white housewives advert and like, let's cast um, a, a punk rocker and a black woman in it and be like, I've, I've blown things <laughs> up. It's like, let's actually like listen to some of the stories, experiences, life experiences from different people. And as humans, we just love that. You know, you love true stories and stuff that feels like, oh, that is real, that's authentic. Like, you know, it just stands out better. And you know, obviously you can do great advertising with middle class white people in it. Um, but often there are like more interesting stories to be told around that. Like, you know, why does it matter? Our job is ultimately to sell stuff if you work in the marketing and the creative, and it, yeah. it works, so yeah. Yeah, authenticity is actually at the yeah. heart of it, and people should be able to relate. Mm. If you can relate and it touches you personally, regardless of your race, religion, or color, if it hits an emotion, it works. And actually, yeah. on the whole, majority of people care. And they want, to, they want actually to see diversity, they want to see inclusion, and they want, they want to be um, educated about it. They want, to, they want to know how is it different for you? How, why, does it, why, why is this different? And I mean, I do, it does make me laugh because on, if, I look, if I watch the TV now, and I've never seen so many mixed race or black families on TV adverts, where did they get them from all of a sudden? You look at, I watch the BBC and I'm like, so all of these people, all these presenters all of a sudden that, that are black presenters, and I'm like, it's not like you just pluck them out of the air. They were always there in the background, but they were never given the opportunity. They were never given that role. And then all of a sudden, the narrative changed and oh shoot, we better do something about it. But that's good, that's good for you lot because actually it's changing now and you will drive that force for good even more. You will do things with social purpose. Brands are recognizing that actually young people shop with purpose now. Obviously I come from a fashion background and um, LVMH, the luxury brands, and even the fast fashion brands are saying, well, hold on a minute, Generation Z look at things very differently. Like going back to your point, yeah. they approach things differently. And when they buy, they don't buy for just consumerism and that want, they buy with social purpose in mind. And it is about sharing and they want, they want the greater good. It's on their agenda, it wasn't on our agenda. Yeah. Sustainability was not on our agenda. I was a fashion buyer, for goodness sake, you know, clocked up miles and it was about, let's get the cheapest price, it doesn't matter, and let's make margin. Philip Green used to, you know, pat us on the back for that. It's changed now. And uh, the, obviously people like Boohoo are under scrutiny for it, but everything, it's changing because the mindset is different. Yeah, and I'm just, just building on that point, you know, around um, sort of authentic kind of human stories, like, there are commonalities between all of us, right, as, as human beings in terms of our relationships and our experiences. And then there is sort of flavor and color built on it based on the, you know, the identities and, and, and our individual experiences within that. And it's the, the commonality of the stuff, you know, as I said before, that really speaks to people. What's really important, I think, is that um, brands don't, because it's such a truth of advertising, telling that human story and like actually brands stay true to that as we progress forward. And, if you remember the Sainsbury's advert that was a black family celebrating Christmas mm -hmm. and there was a backlash to that. Like if you statistically looked at how many people saw that ad favorably versus didn't, yeah, yeah. the minority that was very vocal um, and you know, arguably derogatory and racist about it, let's just put it there, um, it was actually very small compared to the number of consumers who just saw a family having a Christmas lunch and dinner. Yeah. Um, so I think it's, it's really important that brands stay brave um, mm. against the, the, you know, the sort of backlash that can and, and will happen, but also realize that, that that is actually the truth of advertising. It's the truth of you know, growing your brand and sort of delivering your business successfully. And the sort of the flip side example to that is, you know, you look at Dream Crazy with Colin Kaepernick, knowing the audience, knowing the values that they're looking for, and then telling his story, which is all about challenge and overcoming odds and opposition, is something we can all relate to. Yes, it's colored, colored with his own experience, but that's why it resonated. And yeah, that's, yeah. You know, look what it did for Nike. 
I'm going to go. <laughs> this wasn't in your questions, but I, I'm going on it anyway. But I think it'd be really good to hear, you know, what piece of work do you think recently has done everything that we're asking people to do? We're up here, we're saying, let's have more people that look like us in leadership roles so that the work can reflect. Let's get more people, more young people from different communities into the industry so we can make good work and, uh, and, and make, you know, it's not just to make the office look better. Do you know what I mean? It is to make better work. So I want to hear, and then I'm going to ask the audience when we get to the audience bit, but um, go on, Joey. What, what piece of work do you think um, yeah, I, I'm, recently I'm going with up? your definition of work as not being too narrow, and I'm broadly and creative. The thing that I've really loved this year was Heartstopper, which is like not an advert, it's a Netflix TV show. Um, but I love that, and it's kind of like very just positive, natural exploration of like young, queer lives. And it wasn't like the hustle porn you sometimes get. Like sometimes when we start talking about different groups and minorities and things, we're like, ah, oh, you know, what's all that shit? They, oh, what's all the stuff they go through? What's all the, what's all the challenges they go through? Let's tell that. And this was just like, no, living their best lives. Yeah, their kids. Yeah, they got some stuff going on. But and I, I loved it for that. Yes, yeah, sorry. <laughs> We're going to kick him off the stage in a minute. We've got yeah, children I mean, on the sofa. N Netflix are great in terms of how they've just totally lent into um, in their content storytelling and, and representing everybody, but also representing the fact that you can have people from middle class or sort of, you know, like um, upper class backgrounds, that ethnic minorities, you know, we're not all selling drugs on the street and, you know, trying to live, live top boy lives. That, that happens, but they've, they've tried to push a different narrative, done it bravely and, you know, it hasn't really affected how people have consumed their content. Look at Bridgerton, for example, right? You know, you yeah. set a period piece and, you know, there are some questionable things about it, whether or not, like, you know, casting ethnic minorities at a time when some, you know, pretty horrible things were going on empirically. But they've just leaned into that and gone, why can't you have a costume drama where you appreciate, you know, the actors and the story that's being told? And it's massively successful. Um, just coming back to the point on work, I, I'd sort of go towards, like, an organization and a brand that I, I think consistently uh, does it well, and that's PNG. Um, and I think how they tell stories that challenge the status quo around stereotypes, you know, whether it was from the talk to, to you know, the work that they've been doing with um, Gillette around challenging toxic masculinity. Um, I, I really appreciate the consistency in a brand to go, look, this is what we think we need to contribute positively to the world. Yeah. It will also help our business kind of commercially, and we're staying the course on it. And there's Can a, I mean, I don't know about a specific piece of work, but if I think about a brand that I think embraces it, embraces diversity well. The one that comes to mind is Nike. Nike, whatever you, American or English, I don't know, Nike, Nike. But anyway, they, um, uh, I can't remember the, na the name of the chat, but you know when the whole taking the knee thing happened? Oh uh, yeah, that was hey, Carla. Yeah, yeah, there you go. Yeah. And literally, they could have shied away from it, but no, they went the opposite way. Yeah, and yeah. I, I love them for that. I had to applaud them for that. And actually, all the initiatives they do, they, they speak it, but they do it. Yeah. They just do it. There you go. Some of the, yeah, like that, um, you would be fine with like that. This was, was the, the I'm a Londoner or something, that campaign last year, which was also really awesome and just like a very, it felt like a very real expression of like yeah. Beckham and South London and like yeah. not just like someone up in the clouds imagining what London was like. But yeah. 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 Um, is there anyone from VCCP in the room? No? Okay. Um, well, I'm going to big them up anyway because they've just recently done an ad for JD Sport. Has anyone seen it? The London one with all the music artists, and I really like that one. Like, I think it like highlights the culture of London going through, but in a way that just seemed to like stitch together. Have you, have you seen it? No, but it's, when you mentioned JD, it makes me laugh, and I'll tell you why. I worked for them, and I was um, I took over. I was a, a brand director, and um, when I went to the first board meeting, um, everyone was 50 plus white. Mancunian or from the Midlands, I walked in, female, brown, from London. They didn't know what had hit them. I mean, it was just, <laughs> what is she doing here? You know, and people would be like, that's, that's the new, that's the new, you know, and it was, it was really strange. So that's why when you say JD, um, and when I left, the FD said to me, one thing you made us realize is we need more of you. And that meant females and minorities. Mm -hmm. 
Well, it, do you know, then that shows that, you know, a brand, and we all know the stories of the guy that owns it, Ashley, and stuff like that, yeah. but can show that a brand and their agency can go on that journey, and now they're pumping out work where, you know, me as a black man, and I'm like, this is awesome, but I'm not even from London, but I wish I was when I see that ad. Um, I think... As and that really comes back to, like, the, like why representation matters a lot, doesn't it? Because, like, they obviously have been on a journey as a company, and it's probably now because they have a few different voices and perspectives and stuff in the room that they actually are thinking about that stuff. Because I think you know, there, are, there are very few people in marketing who like, are deliberately trying to make, you know, exclude people and make narrow-minded efforts. There may be some, but I, I think most people you meet like, kind of want to, but like, you, we have very narrow views, we have very narrow worlds, and if you're not surrounded by people with different perspectives, if you're not called out on it, if, you're not, like, if that representation, that voice isn't there, it's very, it's very hard to do. So that's why, like, you know, that we can try and separate like the internal representation of our businesses and the external. And of course, you know, as a as a white man, I can make a great advert that talks to you know the black community or something. But it's pretty hard to do that unless I'm like surrounded by people and have input from people who like know that community better than than I do. And that's, those two things are like so closely linked. <laughs> Really good point. I just want to withdraw my last comment. I do not wish I was a Londoner. I'm very happy to be a Mancunian. <laughs> I said it, and no, as you were talking, I'm like, where the hell did you say that? I'm like, absolutely you. not. No, very happy to be up north. Um, I, I, I once wondered if we could go out into the audience. I'd really like to know some people's best work. Um, so what work have you seen recently that you think was really good? It can be your own work, we don't mind. I just want to talk about what you were talking about, authenticity. And I'll talk about my story. My story, for, personally, I'm a thing called Parsi, so I'm Indian, Irish. So my story was I went, I went to stage school when I was eight. So there was a point where I, my agent came, Phil Collins' mum actually, and said, right, to my dad, people don't get it because he looks white, but he's not white, and he's got this name. So I had to change my name to get into the industry. And I'm a casting director now, my name's Mark Summers. And it was really hard getting into this industry. And I would say 30 years ago, there was two companies, I started when I was 16, that were like me, that were maybe mixed and gay, right? Today, in 2022, there's still two companies. And I do a lot of global casting. I'm Parsi, so we have to understand people's cultures, people's sexuality, different things. But still, I think advertising is doing people wrong, especially for me as a casting director. When I read the stories and I read the authenticities and I go down the street, I see people that look like me. I see people that have got brown dads, white mothers, different kind of things. Advertising has to still reflect it because I'm seeing a lot of casting briefs at the moment that say, I want somebody that obviously looks it. Now, we've all got families. If you want to sell in the future, you have to understand about micro diversity. Mm. Like, I'm the only party casting director literally in the world, and we're from a very small community of 5,000, right? But still, representation isn't going on. So when I look at casting briefs, it's very obvious, and it's very much like I see this kind of thing. And the people still to this day, I'll be honest with you, that are doing a lot of casting, I don't mean to cuss, there are great, great people out there, but it's very much a kind of like internal industry, producer's child, somebody's like that. And you know what, if that offends some people, sorry, but that's the way <laughs> it is in the industry today. And if we want to sell, and we want to understand, we've got to understand about culture, we've got to understand different people's things, because brands will not last at all. But also, we need people like me, and that's why what I've done over the last couple of months, I've gone from Mark Summers back to my real name, which is Mark Bomi Sumari Walla and Parsi, and they can pronounce my name because I want to see those kids that I've been promoting for years and years and years and pushing them where other people didn't go to look at me and say, do you know what? Maybe that's me. Maybe I'm not a tick box. Maybe I don't fit into the stereotypes, right? I have an ex-boyfriend who was an international rugby player, but there's never commercials like that. There's never anything else. And I say to advertisers, not just in front of the camera. Get your authenticity, like with the stories and with different things. I mean, I've had brands ask me the stupid questions, like, what do Indian people eat? I said, what do you eat? Do you know what I mean? Absolutely pathetic yeah. things, but we're here to educate, we're here to embrace, but we need people from different cultures, different backgrounds, producers, directors, different sexualities. Now, when I see an intersex person directing or producing, then I know the world's changed. 
And when I see somebody that looks like my cousins, looks like my nieces, looks like my nephews, looks like my sisters, looks like my grandfather, then I know we've come to the right place. But until that time, we have still got a long way to go. And we should never, ever worry about educating and asking, because if I don't know a question about culture, I'm going to ask you. I'm going to go into micro details, but I want to thank you very much today because there's a lot of stuff that you brought up and I'm going to stop talking. But <laughs> it's my observations that a lot of people out there still don't see people in production that look like us and feel like us. And it's not just a look, it's more than uh, skin colouring. That's only 1% of, of genealogy, it's culture. Yeah, and I think you, when you really do have to think about the whole process, I, I get nervous sometimes when people just think about the casting, exactly that, because it's not just like casting different people and everything else stays the same. But obviously the casting is really, really important. And I think on the brand, on the client side, we have to be accountable for the fact that we, just, we never leave enough time for that. It's always like, you know, we spend months and months in like creative development and having our meetings and being slow to respond to our agencies and like, oh, we'll think about that for a while. And it's like, right, now we need to cast this in five days, get it made next week and get it done. And I think we have to, you have to leave room for that to breathe. And then the whole production environment, because you hear horror stories of like, you know, we, oh, we've cast some... You know, we've cast, you know, we've cast this black family, but then we've got, you know, the makeup artists have never worked with black family before. They've, they don't know how to deal with their hair and all yeah. sorts of stupid stuff like that. Yeah. yeah. yeah they, they always make, I always complain that they make, you know, darker, the darker the skin, they make them look gray on TV. Yeah. Why? Because for that reason, right? Yeah, and then just sort of uh, building on your point around micro diversity and that, and also like intersectionality, you know, you asked the question at the top and we, you know, gone, gone far enough. We're not, because we're not talking about that, right? We're still talking about the sort of very inherent um, kind of mega diversity or macro diversity blocks, where it's like, like man the, sort woman, of, yeah, yeah. the obvious yeah, things yeah. when actually there is so much more beyond those, particularly, yeah. you know, people's acquired diversity, where you know, your education, where you grew up in the country. And I, I think a way to bridge that, particularly for both agencies and, and brands, so much, I think, starts in, like, research and insights, right? Before... Yeah. There are tons of like uh, good production companies, say from you know uh, different sort of uh, ethnic or cultural groups. But what's not happening, I don't think, at the point of sort of strategy and insight, is the genuine hard work being done to understand the different communities that you know sit across the group that you're trying to reach. What you're trying to do with that com communication when you actually start telling that representative story. And then that should really guide who do we need to work with to make sure that we're doing this in the right way, that we're more reflective of the actual lived experience people are have, uh, having. So I think more, more, so much more work needs to be done at the point of research and insight. Yep. Um, and as you say, the more time you can give an agency, Jerry, I'll take that all day long. To yeah, make have we work. still got time to ask a few more people? Yeah. Has um, so anybody else got an Oh, there, there, there. Thank you. So, uh, two things. My favourite advert for um, representation was an advert by Rain Allen Miller for Tesco's, which I saw in full in industry press. Amazing. It was a Christmas advert. Loads and loads of brilliant different Christmas dinner scenarios. It was around about the time of uh, Sainsbury's. But what happened when it went to air was, yeah, it went down and there was one, I think, Indian family. Uh, who, who, and they were the only one that, uh, that made the cut. So, and they were, you know, that was sort of, I don't know, it felt like a little... It's a really common thing, like uh, the post-production. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, felt like a little rubbish. But, Etty, uh, talking to your point, there was a programme on the radio just this morning about um, everybody learning to tolerate each other and get on with each other. And there's been a load of research that most people... Are, uh, want to be kind and get on with each other, yeah. but press and the news doesn't uh, doesn't operate like that, and that um, encourages extremes. So I was thinking the same thing about getting back to marketing departments who work on data. And as we know, it's data, but you still skew data. It depends on what you look for in your data, yeah. because that proves the point that you're wanting to make. And maybe getting back into marketing, which is where drives the whole thing, doesn't it? That's where there needs to be a lot of activity and diversity. Yeah, I mean, a lot of the polls that you sort of see at the moment, you know, people place more sort of trust and equity in what the brand, um, you know, the brands that they have in their lives um, are telling them and saying them and, and giving them than they do our current governments. Um, th there's a lot of reasons for that, but I think the exchange in value between the consumer and the brand is an in, sort of an integral part of that. So there is a, a role and a responsibility, I think, not to get too preachy, we can have 
to have a positive effect um, on, on society and the communications and the sort of the stories um, that we tell to kind of counter that narrative. And ultimately, we're talking about like a common set of values, like you, difference of thought and experience. You know, that that's sort of stuff that adds to the richness of the work that we make, but lives in the society that we, you know we have. You still need some way, talking about representation in, in, in leadership, is to bring people together. And that is sort of value set. And to your point on data, you know, I, I would be an advocate for us to stop looking at, well, I mean, we have to look at sort of the traditional demographics of, you know, race, age, you know, how much you earn, but also start actually analyzing what matters to people in terms of, yeah, psychographics, your values, your behaviors, and actually start targeting and building communications around that. Because if, if there's anything we've seen from the last sort of two or three years, particularly what's happening in society, people are much more linked by their values um, and their beliefs and their world outlook then you know, they might be by their ethnic group or you know, their, sort of their sexuality or their gender. The pandemic really, I think, brought that to the fore because people had time yeah. to reflect and sit and think and be aware, awareness. Even you know, just talking about you know, when um, there was a, a proportionally high percentage of uh, black people dying f uh, and colored people, uh, I say colored, black and brown people dying from um, uh, COVID, and it was actually because when, they, when the steering committee had um, decided about you know, the, 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 um, in, uh, the ventilators and all of those things, and when they tested it all, and this is actually, there's research that's proven this, what the, the entire um, group was white. And what they didn't account for is that actually the settings on the ventilators had to be different for the, um, for the minorities. And had, that, uh, if, had they had a black person on the committee or on the group that was researching and looking at all of that, guess what? Or even on the uh, sample, mm -hmm. you know, the sample that they sampled it, guess what? Probably millions of lives would have been saved, or thousands at least in this country. So actually, it's, it's, it's a bigger conversation. Yeah, yeah. I think it's always important when you are, you know, when we, because we have the privilege, I've been on stage with many of us quite a lot of times. Um, and we said at the beginning that we wanted to leave on a positive note. And I really think, you know, wherever you are in your career, um, that actually being in this industry is the best industry in the world because you can actually change Make stuff. You know, like yeah, advertising. Advertising builds up and topples governments. It makes us laugh, it makes us cry. It, you know, it really is the one industry that makes change. You can make people be seen, you can make them be heard. Um, so, and I really, I wanna go along the panel because I know we're, we're coming towards the end and sort of, um, Give your final thoughts of, you know, what can everybody hear? It's lovely that you all come and watch us, but it's just four people, five people on a sofa gobbing off, to be honest, isn't it? So, you know, but it's nice to take something away that, you know, you can tangibly go and try to do with your careers moving forward. So what would be the, like, sort of, try and keep it to a minute, um, <laughs> piece of advice that you would give for people to, to, to go away, you know? What helped you in your career? Or, or what would you like to see more of? Let's, let's start um, with do you know, actually, um, first thing that comes to mind is get a mentor. Mentors are worth their weight in gold. Not only can they open doors for you, but actually you will learn so much, not just about the job you want to do, but about the, the bigger picture. And I think that that is, you know, having a really good mentor, if you have access to one or can find, and just ask. What's the worst? They can't do it and they say, no, you find someone else. Yeah. Be, be, don't be afraid to ask and, you know, find the person that you want and just approach them. Even if it's stalk them on LinkedIn and, you know, send the messages, whatever it is, but try. And if they can't, someone else, they might be able to put you in the direction of someone that can. Yeah, yeah most people actually say yes. You'd be surprised yeah. when you sort of, because a lot of people just want to help, back to Jerry's point. Um, I'd, I'd say two things if I can, I will keep yeah. it to a, to a minute. Um, <laughs> the first one is um, for your own sort of like personal career development is like learning and collaboration. Like just generally collaborate with as many people as you can and always keep a learning mindset um, as you approach your work because the beauty of creativity is that like we can constantly invent things and, and quite often we stay too closed against the people that we work with or the type of work we make. So collaborate. There's lots of brilliant specialisms in our industry and just approach everything with a learning mindset. Um, 
the second part relating to the work and going back round to everything we've talked about is challenge the brief when it comes to representation, like really dig into it to make sure that we've sort of you know, opened the bonnet and pulled everything out about the different groups, the different communities, the different um, sort of values and, and world outlooks that exist in the brief. And from that challenge, then go out and start trying to work with those communities to get to really, really great, meaningful work that connects. Jerry? Cool, yeah, I guess um, a thought that comes to mind, I mean, I'm like a middle-class white man. I think that a lot of people like me, like sometimes when we talk about diversity and inclusion, they either think like it's something for other people to think about or worry about, or let's be honest, they feel like threatened and attacked and like this is, you know, a conversation or a movement which is about moving those people to a side. Now, maybe we should step to the side a little bit to make some space. But like, for me, the absolute thing is like, true inclusion is about, it's about everyone. It's about really um, bringing everyone together. It's about, and frankly, just it's about having a better industry, a be better working, better creative, better everything. So I think, you know, even if you, even if you don't feel you like tick some diversity box or something, this is absolutely still something you can be a part of, you can be an ally for, you can change the shape of your business, wherever you end up being. And also, you don't need to be threatened by it. It's like, you know, no one's out to attack anyone. It's about, like, making room for everyone and make it just a better industry. And I will end with uh, something that I personally think, uh, which is look after each other, your yeah. colleagues, people. This is hard. Talking about every day, you know, I do it every day on stages all over the world. And talking about, you know, trying to tell a room why they should include black people as a black person. And I'm a gay guy as well. So, you know, always having to justify, whether it's to a client, whether it's to a brief, whether it's to on stage in front of you lovely people, this is heavy. And I didn't realize, I, I said at the beginning, I'm not the CEO in Europe anymore. I stepped down and took the chairman role, CEO of North America, because I needed to go away and get, you know, some counseling, uh, I'd see a psychologist to help me because Actually, when you keep talking about trauma so people will listen, it's heavy. And it ain't the job of, you know, black people in school or LGBTQ plus people in uni or a minority group within your workplace. It ain't their job to educate everybody else. If they want to step up, then, you know, give them the space, give them the voice. But just look after each other because this is heavy to talk about, you know. But That's thank really you, great. everybody. Thank you. I'm just going to ask Marnie to say what she thinks that people should do. Be kind. Yay. Yay. <laughs> Thank you to the, whole, uh, to the whole of the panel, and thanks to you as well. Thanks for coming, yeah. Enjoy the rest of the day. I think we get off. <laughs>